All right, we're back again for day number nine. Mirage maintenance. You ride the camel through the sandstorm and stop where the ghost maps told you to stop. The sandstorm suddenly subsides, somehow seeing you standing at an oasis. Parts to fix the sand, parts to fix the stand machines. There's a hang glider. You pull out the oasis and sand instability sensor and analyze. Okay, so our input is the report of many values and how they are changing over time. That's our puzzle input. Each line in the report contains the history of a single value. So 0, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, and so on. To best protect the OASIS, your environmental report should include a prediction of the next value in each history. To do this, start by making a new sequence from the difference at each step. If that sequence is not all zeros, repeat this process using the sequence you just generated as the input sequence. Once all the values in your latest sequence are zeros, you can extrapolate what the next value of the original history should be. Okay, so first history is this. That's the first line, right? Because the values increase by three each step, the first sequence of differences will be three, 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 three. So this is looking like we need to iterate by windows basically until we get down to a bunch of zeros. So we do one for zero, three, three, six, six, nine, nine, twelve, twelve, fifteen. So then we have this. And to extrapolate, start by adding a new zero to the end of your list of zeros. Because the zeros represent differences between the two values above them, this also means there's now a placeholder in every sequence above it. You can then start filling in the placeholders. A needs to be the result of increasing 3 by 0, and so on. Finally, you can fill in B, which needs to be the result of increasing 15 by 3. So it's 3 plus the next one resulting in 18. Find all, finding all zero differences for the second history requires an additional sequence. Does that just mean there's four instead of three? Yeah. Then following the same process as before, work out the next value in each sequence from the bottom up. Okay, cool. So in this, we are going to have to iterate by windows, producing another iterator and probably keeping track of the last value, at which point we can iterate over that folded value and get the result. So let's start here and we'll just create day nine, part one. As usual, set up our test. Now, the one thing that's interesting here for me is this is very kind of simple parsing input. So we would do input.lines and then split white space and that would give us these iterators. And I'm thinking we're gonna have to parallelize this eventually. So I guess we parallelize on lines and that should work out. Okay, so maybe we just do that. Let's get the answer which is next value of second history, next value of third history, and then we add them together. So this is gonna be a sum at the end, and then we go here, 114. Okay, so we get our input, input.lines, and then we need to do this for every line. So we've got split white space, and we'll map that to get, I guess, U32s. What's our input look like? Maybe we just go straight for U64s. We can always try to bring it down later. So line, split white space, parse, We'll unwrap here because all of these have to be valid. We'll add a to-do here so that we can get back to this later. And this is going to be a result. And at the end, we're going to sum everything up. And we're going to sum, I think, into a U64. Okay, so we're set up here. I just need to make sure that our input is getting used. So let's take a little bit of a bigger look at this. Uh, U64 here seems to have a problem. That's probably just because we aren't returning that value here. So the question here, we have our split white space map nums. So now we need to iterate over these using windows. So I think we're gonna find this in iter tools today. Tuple windows will allow us to extract a tuple for every iteration. We do need to, of course, bring the iter tools trait into scope. Let's get our tests going over here. Just work day nine, part one. I did a cargo clean earlier, so we're still pulling down dependencies here. Value of U64 cannot be made by summing an iterator of unit. That is absolutely correct. So we're not really gonna worry about that until later because we are returning unit from this map. We could do this instead and that type error would go away. So tuple windows, it's right minus left, right? So if we map over this and we give it a tuple, then we get right minus left as the value that it needs to be. But we need to do this repeatedly and we need to keep the last one around. So let's start by just breaking it all down and getting to the last value and then we'll work our way back up. So if we have our numbers, we have tuple windows, we can add them together, that's fine. Then we get inherently that next iterator already. So we need to loop over this. So if we do something like this and we store that iterator, then we do a loop here. I don't see how we get away without collecting here, unfortunately, because we do need to check that every value is zero. So maybe we start off easy like that and we do 
a collect here for a VEC of U64s, and then we'll work on removing that collect later. So this is just gonna be our line, and then we need to collect the end numbers into something, which is gonna be a VEC of U64s. And we're gonna iterate in tuple windows, and if we do with position, then we get position left, right. And this is nums. So this is nums.iter.tuple windows with position. We get position here and our two numbers. We can be specific about what we're getting from this tuple window using a type argument with position. And then if we match on position, we get position, which isn't being pulled in yet. Just dumped a random variable declaration at the top to get rid of that. Bring in iter tools position. There's an issue with matching on that. Oh yeah, the one thing we do need to do is make sure that this benchmark doesn't run for no reason. So that's fine, we'll just do this. Just get rid of that sum for now. So I'm gonna break down to just running the tests so that that benchmark doesn't start running again. And then the issue here is that we aren't matching on anything else. So if we're in last, or technically, if it's the only, then we need to save this number. So end, push the right end number, which this back up here needs to be mutable then. And this will be a value, we'll just copy this. Otherwise we don't do anything. We could do if let here, but I wanna match on position last and position only. And then this turns into right minus left. And we collect into this vec of U64s and this becomes nums equals this. And we need to do one check at the beginning. If nums.iter.all num equals zero, then break. That'll break us out of this loop. We can break with a value, but I don't think we need to here. I think we just need to loop like that. Then let's just debug end numbers for now and run this and see what we're getting because this is gonna be a whole thing to build it back up to. So this is inside of process. We should be good. We're running our test lines.map. This is no longer collecting, which is really unfortunate. So let's just collect this into a vec of unit for now. We'll just return unit from it. And that gives us 15.3, which is possibly what we need. Where's 15.3? So we got three and then we got 15, which is correct. And then we end up with 18. And then we need 1728, 1621. So that's not great. Oh wait, no, that is correct. 1621 is exactly what we need because we need this inner iteration and then we create the outer. And then 261545, 261545. So we're good. This is our breakdown here. And then we have our end numbers, which we need to build back up. I really wanna try this with the recursion crate, but I'll, I'll save that for another video. End numbers .iter, tuple windows. Tuple windows isn't quite what we need. We need to give it like the next number as well. So maybe we fold, we start at zero, then we get the accumulator and the next number, and we end up with what? Zero and num. It's not the accumulator plus the number. It is zero plus what equals two, right? No, it's, it's what minus what equals zero. So X minus the number that we're given equals the number that we have. X, the number that we're given, number that we have. It's X minus number that we're given equals, no, number that we're given, number that we have. So it's accumulator plus number. Interesting that that is not allowed to be iterated. Why not? Because it's borrowed after move, because n numbers has vec u64. Let's find out where we're using it. So borrow of move value end numbers on line 16, move occurs because n numbers has vec u64, which doesn't implement copy. Perfect, great. On line 37, debug end numbers and it's moved. Oh, that's unfortunate. That is not, uh, not what we need there. So then we get result and we can sum this then, and then this would be result to string. And if we've done this correctly, our test is passing. I need to update iTerm, but our test is passing. Is this the right way to be doing this? Eh, it works. Looks, feels a little bit messy, looks a little bit messy. There's recursion in here that I would like to factor out. Test pass, if we run day nine, part one, we get an invalid digit, interesting. Why would we get an invalid digit? Because we're dealing with negative numbers and I used a U64. Love when the test input doesn't reflect the actual input. Okay, these are not U64s. These are gonna have to be I64s. Hopefully we didn't do any indexing with those. Just change everything to an I64. And then we need to sum this into an I64 and not mistype on our keyboard. There's an answer. Let's make sure our tests are still passing. Cool, test is passing. This is the answer that we're supposed to take. Gold star, all right, part one, on to part two. As always, we'll have a part one recap later. I think I'm actually also gonna do a refactoring today if I have the time. 
we'll see. There's a day or two left in the bevy game jam and I'm still working on that too. Okay, of course it would be nice to have even more history included in your report. Surely it's safe to just extrapolate backwards as well. For each history, repeat the process of finding differences until the sequence of differences is entirely zero. Then rather than adding a zero to the end and filling in the next values of your previous sequence, you should instead add a zero to the beginning of your sequence of zeros and fill in the new first values. In particular, here's what the third example history looks like when extrapolating back in time. So this is 10, 13, 16, 21, 30, 45. That is our 10, 13, 16, 21, 30, 45. That is the third value, of course. You get 114 again. No, okay. <laughs> I was looking at the wrong one. Adding the new values on the left-hand side of each sequence from bottom to top eventually reveals the new leftmost value, history five. Doing this for the remaining example data above results in a previous values of negative three, zero, and altogether produces two. So we are copying this into part two. This is gonna be two now. And instead of end numbers, we're gonna call this start numbers, stat numbers, start numbers. And then we're gonna push the leftmost in here. And is this a positive still? Is this a plus? So zero and two, two minus two, negative two and zero needs to be a two. Is this the same algorithm? I'm just gonna run the test and see. Looks like it's not two and 81. So fold accumulator number. So if we're given zero, that's our accumulator. We're given two, what minus two equals zero? That is our new X is equal to, well, the accumulator plus the num is not what we need because two, because two here plus the num doesn't equal negative two. So two minus two equals zero, negative two plus five, five plus five is 10. So it's accumulator plus X equals that. So it's accumulator plus X equals the num that we're given. So the num minus accumulator. I did that math wrong. <laughs> um, right, it's the accumulated value, which starts at zero, plus X equals the number we have. The accumulated value plus X equals the number we have. Accumulated value plus X equals the number we have. And then I said it was gonna be the number minus the accumulator. So two minus zero is two. 0 minus 2 is negative 2. 3 minus negative 2 is 5. That seems correct. 10 minus 5 is 5. So it's number minus accumulator, I think. That doesn't fit. Why doesn't that fit? Let's debug that out, maybe. And we'll get a new line there happening in our debug output. So we've got 12 and negative 9. See, 30, negative 21, 25, and negative 23 don't look right. 30? All right, we're going to go heavyweight here and we are going to open this up we're going to use info we're going to have accumulator num accumulator num result is that import tracing info hope i set everything up correctly already we need to use test log in our test now so instead of test we are going to do test log test i believe that will set up our subscriber for us and then we run this with rust log info day nine part whatever and we get our output up here. So that's all good. So then we can read through all of these. So accumulator zero, num 12, result 12. Why is num 12? That looks wrong. Where is a 12 coming from here? There is no 12. Why do we have a 12? Where did 12 come from? Oh, cause we did last. I know, I remember why. Okay, I know why. We need to do position first on our position match. So now we're at negative two. Let's skip input here. So we get accumulator zero, num zero, result zero. Should this be a reduce? Let's debug the start numbers here. Let's do debug, bring in debug from tracing debug. Start numbers needs to be shown as the debug output. And let's increase our log level to debug and we'll get the extra logs. See, and now we're getting debug and info which is nice because now we don't have to remove debug to just see info. We can just raise our log level. So start number zero three, that doesn't feel right. If we look at, yeah, it is right. So zero three or rather three and then zero, right? Is that the way we're iterating over it? I don't feel like it is. Start numbers, iter, fold. Yeah, we start with zero for some reason. Why do we start with zero? Is that what happens in the first one too? Did we just get lucky? We need to reverse this. It looks like anyway. If we reverse it, our test pass. So we need to iterate over the start numbers in a different order than we iterate over the end numbers, which is interesting. I didn't really change the logic, so it makes me feel a little bit weird about that. And this claims to be 1026. 
And that is correct. Okay, so it's a day that is a reward for getting through day eight, effectively. <laughs> okay, so let's do, I guess, our benchmarks. Bench day nine. So what do we have here? Looks like our median time is 214 microseconds for part one and 212 for part two. About the same for part one and part two. They do the same thing, so it's not surprising to see the same numbers here or similar numbers. These are, you know, the same enough in my mind. Let's drag these benchmarks in to sit with all the other benchmarks. Run dat on part one. So we do 358 kilobytes. Not proud of that, but you know, it is what it is. About the same. We are literally two bytes off between part one and part two. So let's get into the actual deep dive here. First off, we've got this list of input. It's a list of numbers on every line. Each one is processed individually. So we take our input, we do the lines, and we map over that. This is still parsing right here. So we've got line split white space. We parse the numbers out here for I64s, unwrap those because they always succeed, and then collect that into a VEC of I64s. We're collecting here to make it easier on ourselves more than anything. So nums is a VEC that we keep having to put back in and iterate over. I still think that we can do this by producing values and we can do th we could use things like scan and whatever, but I'm going to leave that for a another video. So we have all of our numbers. This keeps getting replaced for every level. So as we go down in our pyramid, this keeps getting set again and again. That means we have to keep our end numbers around. So all the numbers on the right hand side. This means both of these need to be mutable because we're going to be pushing into end numbers and we're going to be completely resetting the binding on nums. So then we do a loop. Loop is a wonderful keyword. I love loop. The first thing we do is check to see if nums is entirely zeros. If it is, we break because we're done. Then we take nums if that's not the case and we use tuple windows, which is a function from iter tools. This will give us whatever tuple we want here. So if we had three in a row, we could get three in a row here for the tuple window. We also use the iter tools with position, which gives us this position enum, telling us which place we're in basically when we're iterating. So we map over that, we get the position of the current thing we're iterating over, as well as the two numbers for the windows that we're iterating over. Again, windows here, because we have two of them, it's gonna be zero, three, then three, six, then six, nine, and so on. This naturally crunches us down so we can check to see if we're at the last or the only, because if there's only one tuple left, then we only want to keep the right number. And otherwise we do the right number minus the left number that produces all of the values for this next vec. And then we collect that and we set it into nums. And then we do this over and over and over until we hit zeros. Once we hit zeros, we break out of the loop. This break keyword, it's interesting to know, can return values. We don't use that functionality here, but it could. So we take those numbers that we calculated, or rather the ones we stored from iterating through. We iterate over those, we fold, and we have to use the accumulator plus the number to get the new number. And we return the result, summing that into I64s. Because remember, we're still in this map. So we've mapped over everything and turned it into this number that we're getting. And we want to sum all those numbers. Part two, very similar, but instead of doing the right-hand side, we do the left-hand side of these pyramids. That requires two changes, if I remember correctly. First, we have to store all the values that are on the left-hand side, so all the first values, which means that we're storing the lefts. And second, we need to reverse this list and do subtraction instead of doing addition. With those two changes, we do the same exact thing the other direction, and everything's great. We also took advantage of debug and info today. So if we show s test with just s show, or just s test, we can get our rust log equals debug here. Cargo next test, that's the test runner we're using. I really like it. Day nine, part one, and then no capture. No capture is generally how you see the output. You know what would be really useful though? If I was running the test that we instrumented, that would be that would be the right thing to do. So if we run it with debug, rust log equals debug, this is an environment variable that's pulled in by the tracing subscriber crate, and that will set which logs will output. We've talked about tracing in the past in another video, I believe, so I won't cover it too deeply right now, but we get levels, we get the spans, and we get the actual output that we're asking for. So in this case, we get start numbers, as well as the accumulator, the number, and the result for each of the calculations, because that's what I was having trouble with. And then if we want to say, get rid of that extra debug info, we can run with rust log equals info, 
which raises our level and debug is more verbose than info. So we'll just get this and we can just leave those logs in. So here we can just leave these logs here and here. And if we're not using them, then we don't use them. And if we are using them, then we do. Tracing is a very powerful, nice tool. We finished pretty quickly today, so I don't know how many people are going to actually be done. It's still, you know, about an hour. Quite a few people are, you know, about 39 people have completed it, maybe. There's a couple missing here on the way. We'll call it maybe 30, 35. Pretty good for an hour. Our top three are still our top three. We've got Looking for an Internship, The Fellow, and Siegfried. But overall, love seeing you all doing this. I think that's it for today. I have ideas for how to write this that I am very interested in pursuing. So there may be a refactoring video for this. There may not be a refactoring video for this. We'll find out, we'll see. Have a great rest of your day and I'll see you in the next one.